And then we kind of need to talk about everyone's favorite trick because I think everyone speaking about grid on stage does this and shows this little bit of code. Um, and knowing a bit about sizing allows you to really understand how this works. So this is our ability to add as many columns as will fit into the grid container by using repeat notation with the autofill or autofit keywords. So hopefully this makes a little bit more sense once you've figured out a bit about sizing. Because we're asking grid layout to fill as many column tracks as will fit into the container with a minimum size of 200 pixels. We don't want those tracks smaller than 200 pixels. So grid's going to go through, it's going to add our 200 pixel tracks, and then we get a bit on the end. I don't know, you know, maybe there's 100 pixels left over at the end. Well, that's not enough to put in another 200 pixel track. The maximum is 1FR, so that space is just distributed back over all of the tracks. So they become a bit bigger than 200 pixels. So that's what's happening. It's that available space is being shared out amongst our tracks. So we can get these nice arrangements of boxes. And they're kind of responsive. You know, and they, as you can see here, we've got gaps in the arrangement as grid is just working out where to put things uh, using auto placement. And of course, if we want to, we can set auto flow to dense, at which point grid will backfill the gaps. So we're able to create grids with a flexible number of flexible columns and pack it densely, and the browser just does that for us with a few lines of CSS, which is absolutely magic. So what is a front-end prototype? It's pretty simple. It's basically a prototype that's built in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This is basically the basic tools you need, but if you want to have a more robust front-end prototype, you could use other tools and incorporate other stuff. So the benefits of, 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 of a front-end prototype. The main thing is that there's one master deliverable. One of the things what we did when I was at NASDAQ was that we had over 30 designers working on one product. The good thing about this was that we were using basically this type of method where we have one master prototype and basically kind of branch off of them. So this is kind of the same thing where if you're building a, a feature for a production, how engineers build their products. So the good thing about this is that in some cases, some of the actual features overlap with each other. And the only way we can actually kind of make sure that we use the same uh, content and, and kind of like patterns is that if we had to kind of use it uh, within building it with a, fr a front end prototype. Another key thing I realized, especially working with a lot of data products, is that you want to be designing with real content and real data. Because there's been often times when you don't design with real data, and then once you kind of get into production, nothing really shows up. So my always suggestion is always ask for real content and data, and you always have to be persistent because in some cases, it might be harder to do it um, depending on the company you work for. What is performance? Um, first time I heard this, like in a in a work environment, I was like, what "Are we talking about?" Uh, I was used to kind of like drama or sports or like you know you might watch the World Cup. People talking about performance and things. Um, well, uh, I was hearing things in a different context. When people were talking about it, they were using it interchangeably with things being fast. So, okay, cool. Just a different context. You know, words can mean different things. Interesting. Um, so in terms of web pages loading fast, because that was uh, considered a performant experience. Um, because I think a lot of us, if you're on the phone, if you are ever in patchy connections, you have this kind of thing of like a phone as you're waiting and waiting and waiting for things to load up, whether that's um, on the tube or, um, or on patchy connections or on holiday somewhere. Um, but I think performance is actually wider than that. It's about the user ex user's experience in general. And I want to uh, discuss a few things um, with you about that. So um, this is a screenshot of the uh, my experience that I had when I was on holiday in Iran. And I was accessing the internet through a VPN. And, so, uh, and it was on a device in a new location, so a new IP address, so they asked me for my 2FA, uh, two-factor two authentication code, um, which is in, you know, fair enough. But what would happen is that it would expire every 60 seconds. And by the time I'd actually be able to load the page and enter it, the 60 seconds would expire. And then, and then I'd basically have be trying like, for about five or 10 times to be able to just log in. And that was very frustrating. Um, and, and yes, I mean, I'm sure it, the, the site's fast. On, on, if I'm not using a VPN and I'm not, not on a, a connection and I'm not on like, using a 
tourist like SIM card and things, but I was, I was doing all these things, so my experience was very um, not ideal, I would say. Um, next, it tends to inspire confidence. Um, I thought this was hilarious. Two CSS properties walk into a bar, a bar soul and a completely different bar falls over. And like, ha ha ha, this is funny, but this has also definitely happened to me. I mean, not literally, but like in the CSS sense. Um, and this kind of sucks. This is non-great. Um, this like sort of fear that you can't effectively predict how your changes will, will impact the wider system means that instead of deleting or refactoring existing CSS, you just tend to add more on top of it, which creates more fear for the next time, which creates more complexity again. And you go through a couple of these sort of trepidation to complexity loops, and eventually your CSS becomes an unmaintainable mess. Functional CSS helps get around this by restricting classes to do exactly one thing. So if you apply BG blue to a button, you know that it will not do anything other than set the background to blue. Um, classes are also scoped to their element, which makes it really easy to reshuffle, markup, mark and rearrange components and compose components together without fear that it'll have uh, unpredictable uh, style problems. And um, because all of your functional CSS classes should have the same level of specificity and have a relatively high level of specificity, it should be difficult to accidentally override them and it should play very well with third-party CSS. Um, at the end of the day, basically what's nice is they do exactly what it says on the tin. So the bottom line is that if, if we interact with the page, the browser needs to start serving frames, be it 60 or 20 hundred frames per second. But what actually a frame consists of? Frame has a sequence of steps that uh, they don't happen at the same time. You can't have, for example, paint before the JavaScript or layout after compositing layers. They all have to happen in the sequence. But what what all the steps do? Like what happens in each of the steps? Because this is something that we can actually leverage for, for making our performance better. Let's go through it quickly. So first the change happens and an event is fired. It doesn't necessarily have to be JavaScript. It can be hovering, scrolling, uh, clicking a button that shows something to the, uh, to the user. After that, we need, to we need to recalculate the styles accordingly to the change that just happened. Um, after that, the browser is calculating the layout. So at this point, the browser will try to figure out how much space each element is going to take, where it's going to be positioned, and it's going to present this as a collection of vector boxes. After we know where elements are positioned, everything is getting rasterized and put into, painted to the layers. Uh, we already have pixels at this point, so we take these vector boxes and then we turn them into pixels. So you can think of layers as of layers in Photoshop. If you have uh, two things on different layers, you can move them around nicely and they will not affect each other. But if you have two things on the same layer, they're just glued together and there's not much you can do. So this is something that you can actually leverage during animating, uh, animating things. So by default, uh, the browser has uh, everything on one layer, but there are some things that actually create more, more layers. Uh, there are certainly 3D or perspective transforms. If we use animated 2D transforms in opacity, if we have element that is on top or a child of already existing layer, uh, if we use accelerated CSS filters, in some special cases, video, canvas, plugins like server light or flash, and there's one thing that lets us explicitly tell the browser that this area is going to be changing uh, a lot, like I want to put this on another layer, and this namely will change CSS property. Using will change is, uh, shouldn't be much of a problem. We just need to tell the browser which property is going to change up front. So here, if we wanted to have hover action, we just say will change transform, and the browser will know that this part of the page needs to be on another layer up front. There is one thing, though. Each, each layer consumes memory, so you should use them wisely. If you have too many layers uh, at at once, some less powerful devices can actually crush the browser, and this is not the experience we want for our users. So just be careful with the layers. Then the last step is compositing. Compositing is just taking all the layers that we've had and just putting them into one frame, just putting them into one image. Uh, compositing happens on the GPU, not the CPU, so it's a bit of loading of the work from the processor. Uh, and it also happens always if you have more than one layer. Like the country which is closest to Berlin is Poland. So we have the L with the stroke in Poland, which is not supported by every font. 
So, which has some cute side effects. If you go to Poland, <laughs> um, you find things like this. Sir. I found this on the farmer's market, and I think it's, it's super, super cute and makes the things like nice. But imagine you, you want to design a font and want to sell it like a big company like Google or Facebook, and somebody makes a comment, and this person is Polish or Vietnamese. You cannot fix it like that. <laughs> so, better don't do this. Oh, fuck. Um, so, this is like Instagram. <laughs> I also checked in in Poland, and if you look at this N, uh, yeah, the, this super cute, nice font by this million, mil, myriad, whatever thing, no, billion, million um, dollar company doesn't have a nice font. Maybe they should spend some more money on that. It even it's worse, like if you go to the Vietnamese. Actually, Vietnam is closer to Berlin because we have this big. Uh, Vietnamese shopping mall. This is super delicious, but it doesn't look good if you use the original signs. Yes, you can do better. So, coming back to web design. Web design is 95% typography. That was back in 2006 by Oliver Reichenstein, and I think it's still true. Here's how it can look. There's a number of different ways, and what I really want you to take away from this slide here is that even if you yourself are someone who doesn't really suffer from fear of failure, I guarantee if you're working on a team with other people, there's somebody else on your team who's going through these things. And I want you to be able to recognize it within them so that you can help them out. You can help them see that they're not alone, that it, it's going to be okay. The view that you adopt for yourself profoundly affects the way that you lead your life. That's a very big picture thing, but you can even distill it down into the view that you have for yourself when you're in a new learning experience affects the way that you're going to look and feel and act in that environment. Because let's think about it. With the fear of failure, that doesn't really kick in during times when we're doing things that we're good at. No. Fear of failure comes in when we are faced with new situations, things that we have not done before, times when we are challenged. So you've got to ask yourself, am I going to be gravitating more towards a fixed mindset or more towards a growth mindset. What I want you to know about this is that fixed mindset and growth mindset, these are not places that you live permanently. No, it's very contextually based, very situational. In one context, you can totally be more into the, the growth mindset, that you're super excited, you are ready for those new challenges, things like you see here, failure, huh, I see that as an opportunity to grow. On the other hand, if you are in a situation that's putting you in more of a fixed mindset, that's where fear, fear of failure lives. That's where you see things like what's written up on the screen, like failure is the limit of my abilities, or uh, things that you, you just don't know. Actually. Animation can be used to delight your users. Um, small, um, subtle animation can create memorable user experiences. Um, nothing here is particularly complicated or doesn't need to be, and you never want to do too much. Think of GeoCities and, and MySpace, and you don't want to create that mess. So just be a little bit careful with what you're doing. Uh, use animation to inform your users that something has changed. So um, clicking a tab, clicking a button, using accordions, that sort of thing. Animation can really help sort of cement to the user that something has happened, something has changed. Um, this is especially important when you're um, on mobile, as using your thumb or a fat finger, you can accidentally click something and that sort of helps you um, show the user that they've clicked something and you can sort of see that um, right in front of you. And then finally, use animation to confirm to your user that something is happening. So you've submitted a form, you're sending data, anything like this. Tiny an animations are little sort of rotating circles, um, anything like this can help the user at least see that something is happening, that their data is being saved, that the, the form is being submitted. If you um, don't do this, users have a tendency to click refresh, click the button multiple times, and that just causes issues with web applications. So why use CSS? Um, CSS is performant, simple, and powerful. Performant has an asterisk there, because as the talk from Anna uh, mentioned earlier, there's only a few properties we can use that are really safe to animate. Those three properties are transform, opacity, and filter. And while that might seem quite limiting, you can do quite a lot with just those three properties. But none of this is anything new. CSS animation and keyframes and transitions have been around for years. So why am I here? Why am I telling you this? Well, it just seems that since Apple killed Flash, a good few years ago now, the animation's taken a back seat on the web. No one, 
is really doing as much uh, as they used to be. Um, creativity seems to have fallen, or not fallen, but just maybe taken a little bit of a back seat. So hopefully I can inspire you with some examples of, of things that I've done with just animation uh, in CSS. Um, and mostly combined with SVG. All of a sudden, as soon as we started getting to a custom solution that we needed for us, the design started to evolve, we started iterating. It went very quickly from <laughs> frame working to frame not working. And this was my moment, and I seized it. Let's use CSS Grid! <laughs> it is not a hack. We don't have to start customizing and doing override to override to override in this context and that context. We can just do it. We can just start using this proper layout web tool that's like in your browser, you don't need a preprocessor, you don't need anything. And everybody looked at me like, okay, yeah, we know how layout on the web works. It's going to be painful. <sighs> so here's where we started, right? The classic, everybody can probably picture exactly what the code underneath this is, right? Check out where we took it. I turned on browser dev tools in Firefox just for this. Wham! You're looking at CSS Grid, it is the future, yeah, that is what it looks like. Now, hmm, it looks exactly the same. Why not just use insert old method of your choice? Well, uh, we all know that the hardest part is rarely the code. Right? It's getting buy-in from your team members. It's getting stakeholders, business decisions, everybody on board. It is being the person who's like, hey, we should use this. And actually following through the many, many, many steps ahead of you before you're like, okay, it's live. Uh, and so that is the part that I really want to talk about. Let's look at how that improves the performance. So we can see in the middle here, we have the self-hosted fonts from before. And at the bottom, we have self-hosted fonts with preloading enabled. And you can see that immediately as the HTML is downloaded, the fonts start loading. But you can also see a different thing. The first paint with self-hosted fonts came at 2.5 seconds, but now it comes at 3 seconds. What's happening is that the font with a high download priority is now clobbering the bandwidth and disabling the ability to load the CSS quickly. And there's something we can do about that. The next thing that's going to happen now is that we're moving from the easy stuff to the hard stuff. So what we've covered now, self-hosting your fonts and preloading, that's like the 20% of work that gives you the 80% benefit. Now we're going to flip that around. I'm going to do 80% work to get the last 20. So your takeaways, if you're not listening to any of, of the rest, preload and self-host. So that brings us to today and this talk, and that's why it's called Even More CSS Secrets. And let's get to the first one, which is cut out text. You may have noticed this in the headline uh, of this talk, um, on the cover in the previous slide, and also this slide. So how many of you have used blending modes in Photoshop or CSS? Way more hands when I said Photoshop. So today, we can use blending modes in CSS. They work exactly the same way as in Photoshop. They even have the same names, because they were invented by Adobe at the point where they were interested in contributing to web standards. Um, <laughs> there was a time. Uh, and as you can see, they work in exactly the same way you're used to from Photoshop. Um, I can change this color. You can see what happens. But most people, let's try, let's change this as well. Let's make it a gray or something. You can sort of see what happens. So most people use blending modes because they've pattern matched on how they work from experience. They've tried them, they've, they've seen what happens, but they can't quite explain why it happens. They've instinctively learned that you, you always get a darker color of the two that you're combining, but that's, that, that's about it. So the actual algorithm behind blending modes is multiplication. That's why it's called multiply. It just converts the RGB components of each color to percentages, and it just multiplies the percentages. That's it. So I've made this little app so I can show you here how this works when I change the colors. And you can see the math here and how it changes. I mean, I can even use um, named colors. By the way, all my slides are online, so you can play with this afterwards yourselves as well. 
So the interesting bit here, okay, I mean, it multiplies together the two colors, so you get like the result of the multiplication. What is interesting though is what happens with black and white, which is kind of special. So as you can see, when I multiply any color with black, let's say, let, let me change it, maybe yellow green, maybe lemon chiffon, anything I multiply with black gives me black because I'm multiplying each RGB component with zero. And what do I get when I multiply a number with zero? Zero. So always gives me back black. White has the opposite effect. Let's try a few colors here. And as you can see, anything I multiply with white gives me back the same color. So I can use this here to give me a cutout text effect. All I need to do is give a black color to the text. Uh, no, the other way around, Leah, think. Remember, anything I multiply with white gives me the same color, and anything I multiply with black gives me black. So if I want to have cutout text, which is cut out out of black, I, I just apply a black background and a white text color, and that's it. And the best thing is that it, this degrades perfectly gracefully. If blending modes are not, su uh, are not supported, this is what I get, which is perfectly fine. It's even more readable because it has like the maximum contrast you could possibly get. Mm -hmm.